stabilise in a little while. I think this unit's a little bit low on gas as well, so you might start freezing up early. But that's normal. You'll always get a bit of frost on startup. Yeah, the air coming out isn't particularly warm, but once the compressor warms up, it'll also start putting heat into that discharge line. That's why these are often wrapped in a blanket. You get all the heat coming out of the compressor motor, along with the heat of the refrigerant being compressed, coming out through that tube and being blasted into the room inside. It's a really neat system. I admire whoever, de whoever designed it, whoever thought of it. And as you can see, that check valve is doing its job. It only allows flow in one direction and it stops it. So that's the new capillary tube. This thing doesn't have service valves on it, so I can't put my gauges on it and tell you what the pressures are. But I can tell you now there's a big difference between suction and discharge. And that's what anyone at home needs to take into consideration if you want to build your own air conditioner. You need to have that pressure difference. You need a metering device. Capillary tube is the simplest way. Other than that, you're looking at thermal expansion or electronic expansion valves. We're just starting to freeze up at the bottom here. It'll take a while for this whole coil to freeze up. But this is now the evaporator. As I mentioned before, when you change the cycle, you're just reversing the coils. This evaporates, this condenses. Cooling mode... Well, cooling mode, this evaporates and this condenses. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> It gets confusing at times, but you'll learn. Particularly a lot of my junior viewers who are just fascinated with air conditioners and things. I know there's a lot of people who like watching them run and do things like that. I've never been really into just watching an air conditioner run, but they are fascinating when you understand how they work. So we're getting a bit more liquid through now and she's starting to thaw out. And again, that's normal. This should really be thawed out by now. But I think this system's a bit low on gas or low on head pressure. This is a Fujitsu General, General Compressor. Uh, the whole unit's made in Taiwan, not Korea. This isn't a Daewoo carrier. Uh, fan mode is also Fujitsu General. So it's based on, on uh, Fujitsu components. The other thing is I've got the top off here, so we're not getting full evaporation either. I'm forcing it to really freeze up. Here, the compressor's getting a bit noisier as the head pressure comes up and as the whole thing tries to vibrate the bit. Yeah, the compressor temperature is slowly coming up. And so is the uh, air temperature coming out of it. I'll have to buy an infrared thermometer one day. That way you can just point and shoot and tell you what your temperatures are. That way the viewers can actually see what temperature it's at, not just take my word for it. But believe me, that's bloody cold. If I shut it down, the reversing valve is going to fly back to normal cool mode, so watch this. It's a rather abrupt shutdown. Probably not particularly good for it, but most of them shut down like that anyway. It's only when you turn the thermostat back and let the fan run for a while do the pressures normalise slowly. Uh, I always let mine do that, except for that one there. Unless it's already on its defrost cycle, there's no way I can throttle it down before switching it off. So you always get a nice thunk, 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 and then hiss. Like the compressor's trying to escape from the housing. Just looking at my outdoor heat pump at the moment, which is almost due for a defrost. Some of the roads haven't frosted up yet, but they'll get there. This has multiple capillary injection points on it, so we've got one, two, and three. Yeah, it's getting there. The defrost sensor will be attached to one of the midpoints. That way it doesn't immediately trigger when this happens. Nicely iced at the bottom. <laughs> I don't think these things defrost for long enough either. 
I find that start up while there's still a little bit of ice on them. And this one's performing very well at the moment. Despite the uh, ice on it, it's still putting out about 35 degree, 40 degree air temperature at least. It's really warm compared with outside. Now the electronic side on this unit is a little bit more complicated than normal. This one has an electronic control module which uses a thermistor to detect frost on the coils. Uh, many older ones just have a mechanical switch like a thermostat which will throw it into defrost mode when the coil ices up. That's just a normal thermostat for the indoor air temperature. But a lot of old Kelvinators and things like that have a bigger version mounted up in here. Uh, which is your defrost timer. But in this case it's all electronic. Now, I'm not going to pull the whole thing apart just to show you, so it's all in there though. And that's just a rotary selector switch. Nothing too special, they're probably an off-the-shelf component as a replacement as well. If you're trying to repair one, most of these components you can get off the shelf. Particularly these, I see these thermostats in so many different units. Now this is your start capacitor for the compressor or run. What is it? It's a bit hard to read it, but I think that's actually a run capacitor. There's no potential relay in here. So that's a run cap. 25 microfarad. Again, run caps can be replaced if they blow up. Uh, fan doesn't appear to have a run cap. Oh, there. Yeah, a little black one. 2.5 microfarad. 370 volt. So this is a more modernised unit compared with some of the old ones which still have metal can capacitors for the fans and things and mechanical defrost timers as opposed to electronic. So it's not the oldest thing in the shed at the moment. A lot of compressor terminal designations are marked on the cover so make sure you get that one if you're pulling a compressor out of a dead unit that is. Uh, also check for a run capacitor, they're no good without a run or start capacitor. And that pretty much concludes this video. It is possible to make an air conditioner at home and many have succeeded using refrigerant. But a good understanding of how the cycle works as well as some equipment like a gauge set is essential to building one. You can use them to heat water, you can use them to chill water. Um, you can use them for pretty much anything really that involves heating or cooling. You just have to design and size your evaporator and condensing coils appropriately. Same with your compressor, you can't cool a big cool room, say the size of this shed, with a tiny little unit like this. You need a big commercial compressor like the blue one down there. That would do a small cool room. But something like this, forget about it. So if anyone at home is thinking about building one, just you know, do your homework. Start now and keep doing it. I've had technicians teach me a lot of stuff and I've taught myself a lot of stuff. And although I don't have a refrigeration license, that's about a two year training or apprenticeship course to get it, uh, I know enough about them to work with them safely and legally. Now, there are laws concerning refrigeration work at home and hobby refrigeration. In Australia it's mostly illegal and possessing these gauges is probably an offence in itself, although I picked them out of the scrap bin and put new hoses on them so they can come and get them if they want them. But as long as you use things responsibly, handle refrigerants responsibly, EPA generally leave you alone. Australia there's different laws to America. America you can buy R134A off the, off the shelf over the counter. Australia you've got to document and record every gram. I know a couple of auto AC technicians who have just given up the business simply because there's just too much paperwork and headache. The EPA is making it hard at the moment. But for all those uh, auto AC and home AC technicians who want to start out or people who want to become a technician, young guys out there who watch this channel, well, start learning now. It's still a good business, it's tightly regulated but it's a great business. I wouldn't mind doing it myself one day, but I don't know, I'm a fitter and turner come injection moulder. I make stuff out of plastics and metals. That's my job and I'm sticking to it. Thanks for watching.